To say that Barry Campbell is a star of stage, screen, radio, television, and the orchestral world would be actually uh, putting it mildly. Not only is he star, but he's certainly beloved and uh, owner of the title Mr. Swell Guy, uh, very uh, righteously so. Barry is here in our studio now and going to bring us up to date on his past activities, the past few weeks since his last visit. How does it seem to get back in big town, Barry? Well, it's uh, great to be back, Bob. Uh, I always consider visiting you here as a second home. I always I, look uh, forward to your visit. I have been busy. Uh, we just finished the Calvin Coolidge story. Well, that was finally completed, hmm? Well, uh, as you know, shooting was held up when the gorilla took sick. I remember you told us about that uh, last time. And uh, then we've uh, finished that, and that will be... Uh, Distributed in the fall. I'm working now on the Miles Standish story. That should be a good one. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, don't really know yet. I've uh, just seen the the uh, scenario. I've heard big things about uh, a new picture that uh, you may be starred in. Uh, I understand that you and Skeet uh, Welch are in competition for the leading role yes, in the sure. upcoming uh, Louisiana Purchase. That's right. Uh, I have uh, my agent uh, knocking on doors. I'd like to get that part, the uh, lead part. It's fat and juicy, isn't it? As you know, uh, the part of the president in uh, in that is the uh, prize plum. It's a very juicy part. And uh, I think uh, everyone uh, who is as good-looking as myself uh, <clears throat> really uh, is trying to get into that part. Well, I certainly hope Let's you get, get it. Role. And uh, that we'll be seeing you. Uh, on the screens, in the role of uh, President... Which president was it? Uh, Professor Grover L. Verbley. Yes. And uh, we'll look uh, forward to hearing whether you get the part or whether it goes to Skeet Welch. And at any rate... I might uh, point out, too, that uh, in the event I don't uh, land that uh, theatrical plum, I hope Skeets gets it because uh, he's a real great actor. And uh, I can't think of someone I'd rather see in that part uh, other than uh, Skeets. Well, nothing uh, shows up the fact uh, that you deserve the title Mr. Swell Guy any more than that statement, Barry Campbell. And thanks for dropping up here today. Good luck on all your future ventures. Thank you again, uh, Ray. Bob. If you always had a tendency to do a little petty cheating, like uh, snitching a string bean off a vegetable stand or cribbing on a test, or not saying anything when a cashier gives you too much change... Well, how would you like to turn this tendency to cheat into a real money-making proposition? You can, you know, with the new Bob and Ray Cheater's Kit. It was specially designed by our laboratories for the petty thief, the sneak, and the cheat. Now, just listen to some of the items in this handsome kit can raise your standard of living without raising your tax bracket. You get a price marking set with rubber stamps and purple ink, just like the ones used in all the big supermarkets. Now, this set fits inside your jacket, and as you put each item in your shopping cart, you rub out the price already stamped on it and stamp what you think it's worth in its place. There's a set of charge account plates, identical to those used in the best department stores in your area. You get copies of the signatures of actual customers who have accounts in these stores. All you have to do is shop to your heart's content, show the plate, sign the name, and John Doe gets the bill. Now included is a deck of colorful marked cards that a professional croupier would have a hard time spotting. A rubber gasoline siphon that can draw ten gallons of gas from someone else's car into your own in only two minutes. A complete set of realistic-looking bills and checks that you can use to substantiate business expense deductions on your income tax. Included are used airline tickets, hotel and eating club bills, gift vouchers, canceled checks for various charities, and many, many others. Now, there are many other items in this kit that will help you deceive, double deal, and cheat everyone around you. But we'd like to tell you about the free bonus offer you can get if you act now. We'll send you free with each kit a copy of the colorfully illustrated and an enlightening book, Cheating is a Snap, with a foreword by a well-known charlatan who will remain nameless here, but you'll know him. Now, just listen to some of the chapter headings in this informative book. Chapter 1 is entitled, How to Victimize Friends and Loved Ones 
without being conscious stricken. There's an entire chapter on how to secure a loan under an assumed name. Chapter 12 is devoted to the lost art of shortchanging. A chapter is devoted to what to say and how to appear innocent and hurt when accused of cheating. And an interesting final chapter entitled, Why Not Go On to Grand Larceny? You can't afford to be without this wonderful free booklet, but you must order now. That's right. This offer won't last long when the Better Business Bureau gets wind of it, so act now. Just uh, drop a line... And uh, mail it to Cheating Bob and Ray. The use of any item in this kit constitutes cheating only and does not violate any existing law if you live in Lhasa, Tibet. Therefore, Bob and Ray cannot be implicated in any legal procedure brought against a user of the cheater's kit. In keeping with our policy of bringing you people with interesting or unusual businesses or hobbies, we have a gentleman with us today who recently opened a new shop. His name is Dexter Bulford, a scutcheon maker. How do you do, and thank you for this free radio time. Well, Mr. Bulford, uh, you are an escutcheon maker. I know what an escutcheon is, but I'm sure there are a few listening who may be a little uh, hazy on it. Would you explain? Uh, certainly, Mr. Elliott. An escutcheon is usually uh, shield-shaped and has a Morio bearings displayed on it. That is to say, it's a coat of arms or a seal or a family crest. Well, why in this age of casual and informal living have you chosen to become an escutcheon maker? Well, I think the common man would have a coat of arms like in the days of uh, heraldry, when nobles and knights, tribal chieftains, family clans all had distinguishing symbols to set them apart from others. I think it's, uh, there's a crying need for You'd it. You'd like to sort of see a return to nobility, is that Well, right? not exactly. I just think that the average person should have a crest that depicts who he is and what he does. It adds a little pomp and a lot of circumstance to everyday living. Well, now, uh, from what I understand, you design... Uh, an original and appropriate escutcheon for your customers, and then to make the actual metal shield for them. That's right. We have a staff of specially trained artists who work from a questionnaire filled out by the customer. Well, do you make much money on the shield itself? Very little. It's the other stuff. You see, when a customer signs a contract for an escutcheon, there's a clause in small print at the bottom committing him to, uh, well, a few other items. Other items such as what, sir? Well, they get a dozen T-shirts with the seal on it, a set of sterling silver service for 20 with the escutcheon emblazoned on the handles to go with it, a set of china with a seal on each dish, 25 etched crystal goblets, a vicunia sports jacket with the shield over the breast pocket, a gold cameo necklace, another expensive jewelry, and a luxurious car with the crest as a hood and trunk lid ornament. Not to mention stationery and other sundries. Oh, well, wait. Doesn't the customer hit the roof and cry foul when he finds out what he's gotten himself into? This is well, terrible. On the contrary, uh, Mr. Elliott, most of them are so thrilled with their newfound class that they willingly apply for our convenient 20-year pay plan. This certainly is amazing. Could I see uh, some of the escutcheons you brought along with you? Some there. Well, now, here's one I designed uh, for a Department of Sanitation worker. It's painted appropriately on a garbage can lid. Mm -hmm. It has a banana peel depicted on top here, a bit of egg shell on the right side, half a grapefruit on the left, and all this is painted on a field rampant with coffee grounds. Well, that's very attractive, I'll say. Well, that. we do nice work. Incidentally, that customer now refers to himself as Sir Edward Sweeney, collector of uh, refuse. Well, that certainly gives an air of distinction to himself and the department. What's this one here, sir? Hello, I designed this one especially for you. It has a picture of a microphone in the middle. Oh, that's definitely symbolic. And the microphone is sticking in a big ham. Mm. And it's all in a field of corn. And if you'll sign right here, we can get moving on to the other stuff. Uh, I don't believe I have time, sir. And I think you're a crook if you just leave the studio. Okay, remain a serf the rest of your life. Time now for the interview program, Stand Up to the Press. Today's noted guest is the controversial Congressman Fabio Slusher. Our panel from the press consists of Beatrice Kilfeather, food editor of the Hibbings, Montana Gazette, Post and Citizen, Lance Cumby of the Baltimore Citizen, Post and Gazette, and Clarence Tessie, drain editor of the Plumber's Weekly Journal. Let's begin the questioning with Miss Kilfeather. You had your hand up, I think. Well, uh, Congressman Slusher, on the question of foreign aid, I understand that you advocate as part of the aid program to undeveloped countries uh, that we should build gambling houses and casinos in their major cities. I wonder, could you expand on that? Glad to. That's one of my pet projects. I think gambling houses would create a great reservoir of goodwill for us, not to mention the great savings in dollars, because as I told the Foreign Aid Committee, 
I can get all the one-armed bandits and roulette tables wholesale through some friends of mine. Well, but don't you think building dams and such would be more important for promoting goodwill? Certainly not. You get a Pakistani or a Cambodian winning a pile of rupees in one of our casinos, and you got a friend. But conversely, wouldn't you get an enemy should these people lose a pile of money they earn by sweating in a rice paddy? Oh, that's the trouble with you newspaper people. Always look on the negative side of things. Next question. Uh, Clarence Tessie, your hand was up. Thank you. I uh, had planned uh, to ask you about your attendance record in Congress, sir, in which time I understand you only attended uh, three meetings. But first, I'd like to inquire about persistent rumors around Washington that your last election campaign was something, uh, well, less than ethical. I'd be glad to answer any questions on that. But first, on the question of poor attendance, I'd like to say that I had several bad colds, a case of poison ivy that I got on a junket to Miami, and... I have doctor's notes to prove it. I see, but is it true that you had the ballot boxes stuffed in your last campaign? Well, those stories are malicious lies and absolute falsehoods. I was backed in that election by several public-spirited syndicates uh, through whose fine moral and financial aid I was able to win on the slogan, Slusher will pay a buck for every vote. Well, buying yourself into office is one way of getting elected. You certainly draw a complete blank as far as any knowledge of the issues go. I resent that, you young squirt. I hate to interrupt you now, gentlemen, but I see our time is up. I want to thank Congressman Slusher for appearing, also the members of the press, Beatrice Kilfeather, Lance Cumbie, and Clarence Tessie. Tune in next time when another prominent figure tries to stand up to the press. Wally Ballou is up to some sort of hijinks today. Don't know exactly what it is. He's just signaled that he's ready to go on the air. So come in, please, Wally Ballou. Lou, winner of the Gormley Diction Award for the past four years, standing in the heart of New York's Times Square with a gentleman who is out to prove something. He has built an automobile of spare parts, and in just uh, a few hours, he'll be leaving from New York for the West Coast try and break the homemade automobile speed record. Sir, I wonder if you'd uh, give us your name. Martin Boswell. And uh, where's your home, Martin? I'm from uh, Santa Mariches, Long Island. Uh, Martin, uh, it's taken uh, some year and a half to put this uh, vehicle together. Did you have to have any special kind of permit to put it on the roads of America? No, uh, you don't have to have any permit. I had to go to my uh, filling station and get one of those stamps, though, to prove that my brakes work Uh and that my uh, headlights uh, won't blind oncoming cars and that the car won't blow up. Now, we're uh, going to do this in two visits to you. I'd like to hear a little bit about the car this time, and then when you're ready to leave for a few hours, we'll be here to pick up the department. I don't know how mechanically inclined you are. Not very, Martin. Hello, so then I'll have to make this as simple as possible. Well, what I have here is a wine-cooled, direct-drive, rear-mounted engine. And uh, by that, I don't have any uh, transmission. Uh, Once the motor turns over and I push the thing off, I'm right in direct drive, like a midget racer almost. Uh, Uh, And I have uh, very expensive disc brakes uh, on the front and bicycle brakes on the rear wheels. It's certainly uh, a departure from the cars that we're familiar with. Yes, and it's uh, quite economical. Uh, As I said, I'd probably get maybe 30 miles on a quart of wine. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, you'll be carrying a supply of the car with you, right? Well, you have to. Uh, Uh As I say, I've designed this wine-cooled engine. Uh, uh, I've found that it keeps it cool, and, uh, of course, the content there, I don't have to worry about the radiator freezing in the winter. Of course. Well, it sounds like a pretty good idea. What is the record for a cross-country hop of this uh, sort? Well, you mean with a homemade uh, yes. car? Uh, I don't know what the record is. Uh, I, what I'm shooting for is about two months. Uh, I just to get you. there will be an accomplishment, I suppose. Yes. Not many have even uh, finished it. Well, while you make your I'll last over minute... here through the Lincoln Tunnel. You want to know the route? No, uh, we generally know the way out there. Uh, roads are pretty well back. Down the New Jersey Turnpike. Turn left when you go through the tunnel. Right, and then I'll go. Uh, then I'll go over the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh-huh. And then I'll connect up onto the Ohio Turnpike. Right out through the Indiana, Indiana yeah. Turnpike. We know the way. Well, and, uh, uh, while you're making last minute adjustments, Martin, we'll go back to the studio and hope to pick up your departure the next time we're on the air. All right, fine.
Wally Ballou, over now to Times Square, and Martin Boswell, who's about to leave in a homemade automobile for the West Coast. Come in, please. Wally Ballou. And the crowd is getting a little impatient. The police are uh, telling Mr. Boswell now that he must move the vehicle out of Times Square. It's uh, holding up traffic and attracting too many people. Martin, have you got all the adjustments made and uh, got her filled up? Yes, she's all set. Uh, I might point out that I think this is uh, the only uh, homemade car with a self starter. I've uh, installed a solenoid by myself, which I think uh-huh. is a uh, radical departure from the average uh, homemade vehicle. And this for time. anyone who wasn't listening when we first talked with you, we'll just uh, remind them that this is a wine-cooled engine. Wine-cooled, direct drive, rear-mounted. And uh, that he's going to head uh, out of Times Square and uh, through, through the, the Lake West Coast. Tunnel, through the Lake and Tunnel. Down the Jersey Turnpike. Right. Well, we and know the way. Oh, all right. And uh, will you get in now with right. our best wishes and we'll hear the Thank start. you, Mr. Below. It's been a lot of fun. Well, and uh, now we'll start our... I hope we'll see you when you come back, Martin. Now I'll stand back here on the sidewalk as Martin prepares to leave for his cross-country job. He's been having a little little bit of difficulty turning it over. He's whistling happily, apparently isn't uh, upset in any way. Quite a pile of traffic behind him uh, being held up. And uh, what seems to be the trouble, Martin? Walk start. Uh-huh. Weather like this, of course, uh... People's tempers are rather short. Several of the people have gotten out of the cars behind them and are heading down this way. He's just sitting there, turning on the car. See what I'll do is I'll go through the tunnel and then I'm going left. I have to down the New Jersey Turnpike when I start this thing. I think uh, those people are rather angry that are descending on you in a group. Would you give me a push now? And, uh, if I don't do any help, I will, yes. Uh. And see right. you later. That goes just to the nick of time. And he's off for the tunnel and for the West Coast. And this is radio's Wally Ballou standing on the sidewalk. again. Before we can set up camp for the night, we got to get off the horses. Oh, don't remind me. Yeah, I've been thinking about it the last couple hours, riding along. Well, here, I'll get off first, and then I'll have to go down. Oh, that's the way we did it last time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, my foot's got in the syrup. Yeah, yeah. I'll, and let me help you. Can you back around this way and kind of give me a boost? Yeah, all right, back around, Betsy. Oh, oh, it's too oh, far. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Now forward, Betsy. There we go. Oh, you just stay there, Ed. Well, I can't move now the way I'm... All right, now... Way off the Now, just stand still a minute now. Now, let me... I'll lift your left foot out All right, the stirrup. here we go. Now, at the same time, throw your right leg over the horse. Right. Uh, oh. Oh, oh, now, oh, oh. Now, I'm just facing the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. facing backwards there. Still I can't, on. I can't, I can't go that way long. No. Tell you what. What? You see that branch over the tree there? Right. Grab hold of the branch, and then I'll give the horse a slap, and she'll run away, and you can drop to the ground that way. All right, fine. You got a hold of it? Oh, here we go. All right, help. Get up there. Come no, on. Get up. Get up. Wait a She's just standing there. Well, the branches give way. Yeah. Oh, I got the branch here. I'll never get down. It's heavy. How about letting me try to get down? First? Well, I got a branch here in my hand now, and I'm facing the wrong way. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, you dropped your hat. Oh. Yeah. Well, here, let me see if I can do this. If I swing my leg over that way. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I'm gone. I'm oh. gone. Oh. I got the branch. Hey, hey. I got the branch. Well, drop it. I can't drop it. Oh. Well, here I am. Well, I'm making the circle. I'll be back. Oh, all right. But I'm facing the wrong way. Well, that's nothing. I got both my feet in the left-hand stirrup. 
Well, don't fall. No, I'm hanging on as best I can. Well, well, I don't think we'll camp here. No, I didn't like this place much anyway. Let's no run head away. Who? Oh, All right, who? Hit up, Betsy. Once again, we're down in the workshop of Eva Quam, the do-it-yourselfer. Eva, it was awfully nice of you to ask us back. Well, as a home handyman, aficionado, you're always welcome to my basement workshop. I know that you've spruced the place up a bit, Eva. Isn't that a new living room suite? Yes, the furniture arrived yesterday. It's Swedish modern, and it cost me $6,000. Looks great, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All new and shiny and everything. No, I'm going to take care of that right now. I'm going to antique the whole suite, or suit. Right here in my basement workshop. There's a man who runs an antique shop in Connecticut who promised me $5,000 for the suit if I did a good job. Mm -hmm. But uh, doesn't that mean you'll take a loss of $1,000 on the job? I suppose so, but I take a good deal of pride in my work. You need good furniture if you want to make it look good. I see. Well, now, uh, what's the first step in the uh, antiquing process, Eva? Well, I was about to start just as you came in. I guess you noticed me holding this heavy chain. Yes, I wondered about that. Well, as someone who's interested in home craftsmanship, I thought I'd let you in on a little secret about the first step in antiquing. What's that, Ivar? Well, I'm about to beat this end table with the chain, and it's going to be much easier than it looks. Really? Sure, there's not much to it. Well, just move back, though. Sometimes there's a backlash when I swing the chain. That's good enough. Well, uh, that looks like it's damaging the furniture pretty well. Yes, it's marking up nicely. Actually, I should have my shirt off while I'm doing this. It's hot work. But the effect is the same shirt on all. I think that's got it now. Well, I think it looks a little older. What's the next step now? Well, I've got to buff the top with a special mixture of barley water and commercial diamonds, being very careful that I use a lot of pressure when I rub, like so. <laughs> Uh, what does that accomplish, Eva? Well, it dissipates any traces of newness. Commercial diamonds are very hard, you know. Yes, I know. I say, that's interesting. It's quite a trick, you know, just when to stop on these things, though, isn't it? I mean, you can go too far. Oh, yes. Well, the idea is not to completely destroy the furniture. If you do that, no one would buy it. you still got lots to do here, though. And if you like, you can help me in this next step. Sure, what do I have to do? Just start kicking the legs like this. Is this all right? Yes, you're doing a good job. Seems you've got a knack. All right, there. I think that's got it. Now it looks good, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, is it finished? No, no. We've got to burn her a little bit. you have a match on you? I think so. All right. Yeah. Step back now. Sometimes these things flare up. I just set this match to it. Well, there it is. A pile of cinders. Is that what you wanted, Evar? No, these things at best are hit or miss. It's not a complete loss. I can use the cinders to line my pipe. And so we've seen another perfect example of better living by doing it yourself. From here in the workshop of Eva Kwam, the famous do-it-yourselfer. This is smiling Jim Hardesty, who's here to give troubled phone callers a lift. If you've got a problem, pick up the phone and call Pickering 32000. For those of you in real trouble and don't have a dime for a phone call, write to me in care of this station, and an almost exact replica of a ten-cent piece will be sent to you with the head of FDR altered to suit the sponsor. Now, hello? Hello, is this smiling Jim Hardesty? Yes, and what's your name, sir? Waldo Bigger. I'm in an awful lot of trouble. Well, don't worry about it, Waldo. Smiling Jim will straighten it all out for you. Well, I hope so. I'm calling uh, Ship to Shore phone from my dinghy. And yeah. uh, there seems to be water coming in, and it's up to my waist now. Well, how much uh, time do you think it's going to take before you're completely underwater? Oh, any minute now. It's rising pretty fast. Well, Waldo, don't. Don't worry. Tomorrow, first thing, I'm going to write the Aqualung people. I know the president of the firm, and I'm sure he'll send me an Aqualung in two or three weeks. And meanwhile, you just relax and take advantage of the fact that you don't have to work. So long, Waldo. So long. Smiling Jim here. 
Hello, Smiling Jim. My name is Mrs. Dolores Dover, and I'm in a pack of trouble. Well, the best thing you can do when you're in trouble is to face the issue squarely. If it's any help to you, when I get in trouble, I fly right out to New Bronzefells, Texas, and stay there till things cool down. Uh, what is your trouble, Mrs. Dolores Dover? Well, when I first married my husband, I didn't like the way he looked. I liked the way Milton Burl looked, though. So I sent my husband to a plastic surgeon and had him made over to look like Milton Burl. Well, where's the trouble in all this? Well, he looks like Milton Burl, all right, but uh, he's nothing like him. He never cracks a smile or a joke or anything. He just sits there, and I keep waiting for him to be funny and all that. Tell you, it makes me nervous. Well, it's a naughty problem, all right. But I think Smiling Jim has a solution. Do you know what James Mason of Hollywood fame looks like? Yes, he's broody and all like that, isn't he? Sort of. Well, now, if you took your husband back to the plastic surgeon and had him done over to look like James Mason, I think it might ease the situation at home considerably. But I warn you, if your husband objects to these operations, you may find him developing a wry sense of humor. And in that case, you might very well find yourself with a joke-telling James Mason. Well, gee, nothing's easy, is it? Not if it's worthwhile. Goodbye, Mrs. Dover. Goodbye, Smiling Jim. Smiling Jim here. Uh, say, this is Waldo Bigger again. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to hog your program or anything like that, but uh, I got to thinking after that phone call. Yes? I mean, it was nice of you to offer the help you did, and don't think I didn't appreciate it, but uh, do you think you could get the aqualung to me any sooner? I mean, I don't think I can hold out for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. The water's up to my chin. Well, now, I won't make any promises, but I'll try to expedite things and rush it through in a week or so. Might be able to send you a pack of cigarettes in a hurry, though. How'd that be? Hey, that'll be swell. I'm dying for smoke. So if you can't... So this is Smiling Jim bringing to a close another session of Troubled Phone Callers. And please call. I can help you as I've helped millions of others. And here's uh, Webley Webster with... What I presume to be another book review. This would be literature time. Huh? You are absolutely correct, Bob. I have a very interesting book that I just finished reading a few days ago. And I've brought a lot of lovely work to players who are in the studio, all set to dramatize what I think is the most interesting part of the book. Webb says that he has just read a very interesting book. Look, you don't have to translate for me. People know what I'm saying, Bob. Well, I know, but... Uh, no translations. After that speaking engagement that... Uh, went so badly for you. That I was think, a shame. I think maybe a little translation. That backfired badly. Well, what book have you read, and what are you going to review then? Be My Guest by Conrad Hilton. Be My Guest by Conrad Hilton. That's why. Oh, that's a good one. I've, I've uh, seen that. And the players are going to do a scene from the book? Is that yes, right? that's right. This happens in the third chapter. Uh, the boat's about five days at sea. The, the boat? It's about five days at sea. And uh, we look in out of now. now Set for me, Captain. Come over here, matey. All right, sir. Where be the wind? We'd be calm, sir. It's what we'd be. Why, you... Up and off the deck, lad. That ain't no way to be talking to the good captain of this tub, no. That's easy, sir. I merely said we'd be calm. There's no wind. Why, you... I'll ask. When I want you to talk, mate. Aye, aye, sir. How long do you think we can be be kind? Up off on the deck. me with that one, matey. Up off on the deck, lad. Ah, aye. Now I think maybe you'll keep a civil tongue in your head when you talk to the captain. I think maybe I will, Captain. Why, you... Oh, oh, oh. We'd like the way you said oh, that, lad. Taking it easy, sir. Up off the deck, mate. Oh. Now then, go below and bring me the captain's port. What's that, sir? I said bring me the captain's port. Well, you'll have to wait till I go downstairs, then. Oh. This was in the third chapter of Be My Guest. By Carl Reisnoble. I don't know what versions of these books you get, but I, I don't Dad, know. Dad, I, really, I recommend this book for everybody who loves adventure and okay. hotels. All right, we'll look for another book review from Webley Webster someday real soon. Hello, 
And welcome to the gray telephone pages of the air, where you find everything. And to attest to that, we have some guests with us today to tell us all about it. Our first guest, Mr. Edgar Smear, tracked down a hard-to-find bottle opener in the gray pages. Is that right, Mr. Smear? Yes, uh, I needed a bottle opener to open a bottle, and I didn't have one, so I looked in the gray pages under B. And I guess you found dozens of places in your neighborhood where you could get a bottle opener. Well, the nearest place listed on bottle openers was a hardware store 40 miles away, but uh, I was very thirsty, so I went. Did you get the opener? No, the store hours were from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I guess the owner must have been a gigolo or something. Well, what did you do then? Well, I thought I'd uh, look at the gray pages while I was out in Newark, and I found it was a hardware store in Forest Hills that sold bottle opener. Well, that was lucky. It was right on your way home. Yeah, but it was late at night, and that store was closed, too. When I got home, I found that the bottle had cracked in the refrigerator, so it didn't make much difference anyway. Thank you very much, Mr. Smear, and I'm sure the gray pages found another friend in you. Sure. Our next attester, too, is a Mrs... I believe it's Mrs. Ethel Wellawater. Well, Wellawater? Wellawater. Wellawater. And uh, what is it you found in the gray pages? Well, I've always wanted to own a cigarette vending machine to discourage the mooches who came to visit me. I guess the quick flip of the gray pages found you exactly what you wanted. No, the print's very small in the gray pages, and I had to borrow my son's magnifying glass. So you peered through the magnifying glass and you found what you wanted. Is that the way it happened? No, my son was setting fire to a chicken coop with the magnifying glass, and it took all I had uh, to get it away from him. We were both badly burned during the ensuing struggle. Yes, you had to look under P for a physician in the gray pages after. That's right. Those uh, third-degree burns we got cost me a pretty penny to get us looked after. I had to forget the cigarette vending machine. Well, that's a shame, Mrs. Uh, Wellotter. Maybe uh, you'll get it next year, and thank you for being with us today. That's okay. The doctor said I needed some fresh air. And our last user of Gray Pages for today is a Mr. Arvo Cult. And uh, what is it you wanted to find, Mr. Cult? Nothing much. I was just reading it. Just uh, for reading? It's a novel approach to the Gray Pages. Well, not when someone steals your private library, it isn't. I didn't have anything to read, so I read the Gray Pages. Do they make good reading? Ah, the book is trash. I'm a university-trained man, and I can tell you that the book is a mountain of nonsense. Well, all I know is it's helped thousands of people in finding what they wanted. Maybe there's nothing you want, Mr. Cult. Yes, there is. I'd like your name and address, young man, and when I get it, I'm going to send it and a lot of other information along to the local precinct and try to have you arrested for malicious conduct on the air. Goodbye. So we bring to a close another edition of the gray telephone pages of the air, and don't forget, use... Only the gray pages and beware of color substitutes. Wally Ballou is standing in the hot sun. Come in, please, Wally Ballou. Sun, and it is hot as we stand here trying to say hello to one or two folks uh, who are... Making the best of the warm weather. How about you, sir? I wonder if you'd uh, speak into our microphone just... Arnold E. Fenwick. Corporal, United States Army Reserve, retired. I notice you're still wearing your Army suit there, Corporal, with that... the puttees and That's the right. uh, Boy Scout hat. Uh, is that right? a Boy <clears throat> Scout hat. Well, it's uh, one of the Army-type hats that's no longer used. Campaign use. hat, Campaign we hat. call them, fella. How are you making out this warm weather? Well, fortunately, I have my woolen suit on, my my uh, woolen puttees, and my uh, woolen long johns, as we call them, uh, and my campaign hat. Doesn't that add rather to the... Uh... On the contrary, wise. A lot of these people think that when the hot weather arrives, you should wear thin, light clothing. I disagree with that 101%. Do you mean that you keep out the hot rays of the sun by wearing all of this? I know you're carrying your army overcoat. Why don't you wear that, too? Don't get fresh with me, fella. Well, it's just you had all these clothes on. Our tempers are short in weather like this. And uh, I must remind you that we are on the radio. And uh, we don't want to get... You get get paid for it, don't you? I don't. Well, I know that, but uh, I just can't see wearing all of this kind of balderol in uh, weather temperatures like we've been having. And if you think it keeps you cool, I think you're off your rocker a little bit. Let's try this lady over here. Well, that's for me to know and for you to find out. Pick some stones or I'll break my bones. Uh, and pull uh, this fist, fella. All right, back to... <laughs> Uh, 
Time now for the Bob and Ray horoscope of the air, and for all of you people born between July 22nd and August 21st, Leo's, you'll find this an excellent day to be with people. So, go to the ballpark. But the evening hours for you, Leo, seem to be remarkably good ones for communing with yourself in the solitude of a movie. And the alert to purse snatchers. Now, for the Aquarius people, January 21st to February 19th, today seems to be the day to accept advice from your close acquaintances and reject those who tell you that you have no friends. Yes, and in the afternoon, a number of showers will tend to put you in a splendid frame of mind. Then you can go out and be bent on pleasure. What's for the Aquarius people during the evening hours, Ray? Aquarius people will find that a trip to Switzerland during the evening hours would be propitious. But be back before midnight as your day ends there. And now let's move on to Pisces, February 20th to March 20th. Yes. And for those of you who fall into that category, today is a splendid day to get on with your associates at work. Also, it's a good day to ask your boss for a raise. You'll be turned down, but the splendid gesture will make many of your associates admire you, and this will give you confidence to ask your boss for another raise in the afternoon hours. You'll be fired for asking for a raise twice in one day. But you will have earned the respect of your associates, and you'll have a free afternoon in which to visit the museum. That's right, and you'll find the evening hours a good time to look for a new job. And don't get tired. And now for the Capricorn. Oh, today's a wonderful day for self-analysis. Try it and find out what you are. Yes, and if the results aren't gratifying, become a hermit. You'll find communicating with wildlife will add to your already splendid personality. But stay away from larger animals in the afternoon hours. You may find them intractable, and in that case, you'd stand a good chance of being eaten. What's next, Bob? Gemini, May 21st to June 21st. A good day to clear up any dissension between you and your wife. That's right, but you must do this during the early morning hours, and if you argue, argue intelligently. It will be of vital help to you, especially if your partner has remarkable flashes of insight and decides it would be best to leave you. And in the afternoon, hide your wardrobe. It's a splendid day for having your suit slashed by your wife. And how about the evening hours, Bob? Well, I would think that would be a splendid time to make new social contacts. Also, lay aside any home planning ideas you may have had in the past. This is a useless period. What's the next horoscope, Bob? Sagittarius. A bleak day for all concerned. So tie yourself to the bed when you get up in the morning, and don't struggle. All people born on this day will be hit by falling safes. That's right, and that about wraps up today's intimate horoscopes, but be with us again soon and find out what happens to you. And now welcome to Expense Account. The story of Charlie Wisher, who works as a salesman for a wine concern. It's a story of the expenses he runs up. Glad to see you back from the road, Charlie. I'm glad to be back, uh, Mr. Bruce to be. And uh, here's a list of the expenses I ran up. Well, for a three-day trip, $26,000 of expenses isn't bad. I guess you must have lived nicely, though. Sure, Mr. Bruce to be. No sense in grubby living, is there? No, of course not. I used to be a salesman myself, and I can cheat with the best of them. Now, $3,000 for taxi fares. How did you manage that? Well, I took a taxi from Spain to France, and the snow held us up quite a bit, and uh, the meter didn't stop for a second. Tick, 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 all the way. Well, Spain isn't so far from France, is it? Well, we got stuck in the Pyrenees for a long time, and the driver refused to stop the meter. Can't say that I blamed him. Do you sell any wine in France? No, they got plenty. I'm never going to listen to tips again. Well, what's this $2,000 item for ski wax all about? Uh, that was in Norway. All the wine buyers over there love to ski. A good many of them are champions. And I couldn't get them uh, cheap ski wax, you know. They know their beans about that stuff. Oh, I'm glad you used your head. Wouldn't want one of my salesmen to fool a Norwegian wine buyer who skis. But you must have bought three tons of it. <laughs> yeah. Did you do any business while you were there? Well, I almost sold a bottle in Oslo to a Norwegian bum, but uh, he ducked out on me before I could complete the sale. Who needed him anyway? Well, we do. We've got a lot of barrels festering in the cellar. Oh, don't pull that hats and flowers stuff on me, boss. It's hard to push wine that has only 1% alcohol content. Speaking of flowers, I see you spent $1,500 on them. Well, I accidentally walked through a guy's tulip bed in Holland. And uh, I ran into a windmill to hide, and I almost got ground to pulp. Uh, I had to shell out when the guy threatened to hit me with his wooden shoe. Now, no job is worth that, boss. I guess you didn't do much good there, either. 
Well, I got there at a bad time. See, water was coming through the dikes, and everybody in the country had to stand around with their thumbs stuck in it. I guess that included wine buyers. Ah, uh, that's right. Good boss. salesmen would have gotten the high and low tide tables and checked on a thing like that. Well, I did get the tables. It cost $1,900. It's on the list there. I see. see. What's this $10,000 expense? I ran into a tin miner in Bolivia, and he sold me a secret map showing where Argentina was. Now, I couldn't pass a thing like that up, could Certainly I? Certainly not. Say, did you sell any wine at all on this trip? Not a drop, boss. I almost sold some to some pygmies along the Amazon, but uh, they didn't know what it was, so they didn't want it. Your trip, then, was a complete loss. That's right, except for the fun I had with the expense account. Well, I like an enterprising man. So long as this firm is around, you've got a job. Thanks, boss. Hello and welcome to a new psychological program known as The Talker, a grim study of a man who constantly talks at the wrong time. And it's our intent to show how this unfortunate affliction caused him to enter into a great many job failures, including his last job as a caddy. Hey, you're certainly not going to use that club, are you? Yes, why do you ask? Well, if you do, the ball will land right in the lake. If that's where you want it, you go right ahead and swing. Makes no never mind to me. Well, I've been National Open champ for ten straight years. How long have you been a caddy? Three days, but I know a lot about wind currents. I think <clears throat> you're standing on my tee. Would you step off it so I could sure. see? Sure. I think I broke it. Either that or I drove it into the ground. I don't see it around. Want me to look for it? No, I've got some more. I keep them on my hat band. You don't wear that hat in the city, do you? It'll create a lot of combat if you did. No, I wear a fedora-type hat in the city. Now, would you step back and let me tee off, please? Sure. But you're living in a fool's paradise using that club. Well, I'm not your keeper, so you go ahead and swing. I will. I told you, right in the lake. Better throw that club away. As long as you have it, there'll be trouble. I think it's jinxed, and you may be too. I think uh, we'd better get on to the next hole. Sure. Hey, why don't you go down to Haiti and have a couple of voodoo rites performed over yourself in the golf club? I hear that sometimes helps. I don't think that will be necessary. No, it's just a suggestion. I only mention it because I know a lot about voodoo rites. I once saw a man turn in a stone down there. Well, here we are. I'll do better on this shot, I think. I don't think so. I had an uncle in Portland who once told me something about golf courses. He said if you stand on grass for a long enough time, you can get drunk from the smell of it. Was your uncle a golf player? No, he's one of the best skeet shooters in the country. But I guess he knew a lot about other things. Uh, better step back. I'm going to swing. You don't learn much from past lessons, do you? Well, I try to muddle along in my championship fashion. It's worked for me so far. Well, I guess that's because you've been playing against a lot of bums. I don't see anything so hard about hitting a ball on a lake. Look, I don't seem to be able to concentrate very well with you around. Uh, why don't you go back to the clubhouse, huh? Uh, I'll carry the clubs myself. Sure. You're bad company anyway. Just pay me my caddy's fee plus a large tip and I'll be on my way. It's very depressing around here. Okay, here's your caddy's fee. Now I'll give you a tip. Start running and don't stop. Because if I ever catch up to you, I'm going to weld this club to your nose. Now beat it. Sore loser. Sore loser, bad golfer. And so we bring to a close the first edition of The Talker. Be with us again soon. You have my personal guarantee that The Talker will lose another job at that time. We had a distinguished visitor here just a few days ago. He couldn't be here for a live broadcast, so we had to put his answers on tape. Uh, but it's the same thing, whether he's here now or was here just two days ago. And uh, it's Wallace Benson, famous character actor who's appeared in numberless movies. Hello, Wallace, and welcome to... Well, I hope you're right about that. Another 15 years of acting. I'll certainly look forward to it. Wallace, uh, I don't know if you'd care to give us <laughs> your exact age... Well, I understand uh, you were born in Massachusetts. The line was, better get them apple seeds in the ground, Johnny. Engineer, I think there's a little trouble with the tape. Right, let's uh, try it again. Well, that's a big order. But if we can continue doing the series, I think we'll have a hit on our hands. Leastwise, we hope so. The critics are good to us. <laughs> How do you like uh, visiting... Your... Through Massachusetts... 1897, and I went on the stage, 1904. Wallace, can you remember the, uh, well, who did you enjoy, let's put it this way, who did you enjoy working with most in your long and distinguished 
theatrical career. You're right. I was seven years old. Oh, wait a minute. Engineer. Engineer. Will you, will you roll that thing? Hello, right? Bob and Ray. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Wallace. Fire away. <laughs> okay. Are you all set? <laughs> well, this does happen, friends. Wallace, I'd like to ask that question once more. We all said, Engineer, who uh, did you enjoy working with most in your long and distinguished theatrical career? That line was, I know the horse can win the big race. Put her in. You've been listening, friends, to Wallace Benson, famous character actor who's uh, appeared in numberless movies. We want to thank you for coming. I was seven years old at the time. And next time you're here in town, hope you'll drop in. Hello, Bob and Ray. It's oh, real... forget it, Engineer. Okay, we just got the go-ahead signal and a long-distance call. It came in about two seconds before, and I'm on the wire now. Operator, do you have the party there yes, for us? It... This is Bob and Ray. This is a collect call for your chair. Uh, it isn't Steve Bosco, is it? Because no. we've decided not to. No, it's not a Mr. Bosco. It's a Mr. White Chapel, I believe. Mr. what? Mr. White Chapel. What? Thurber White Chapel. I think operator. that's it. All right, put him on. I suppose we can wrap this up once and for all. Hello. Hello? Uh, Bob and Ray here. Who? Bob and Ray. Well, what did you want? Uh, well, we had a call from a Mr. Thurber Whitechapel. Speaking, operating. speaking. Thurber, is that you? Yeah. I didn't recognize your voice. Who is this? This is Bob. Of what? Of Bob and Ray. Bob Elliam. Were you calling from uh, North Chicago? No, I'm calling from Green Vista Hospital. Uh, is this uh, the Bob and Ray? Of... Yes. Swell. I've been thinking about that story. I've had time to think it out now. What are you doing in the hospital, Thurber? That's Very little. I'm kind of more or less uh, restricted in my movements. Yes. Uh, and out, so to speak. And I remember last week I heard the thing. commotion in the background when you were calling from home. I explained to the nurse how important it was that my call get through. Uh, per our arrangement and agreement that you wanted to hear all the stories that uh, I could send you. We did. You sound and, so uh, different, uh, Thurber. Uh, uh -huh. They must be doing good things for you. We didn't make any arrangement, however. I'm not as excitable as I used to be. What's that? I'm not as excitable. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, no. We didn't make any... Beautiful here. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. Right? We I'm uh, going, going to... Stories? Nothing. I didn't think so. I'm uh, he ever going to be here for a few days, days and then I hope Hello. that uh, maybe I could get Hello. to make... Yeah. We don't have any arrangement with you, sir, if you want to... Uh, I had a very interesting story on the way over here to Green Vista. Uh, came over, accompanied by uh, two young fellas. Yes. And uh, very understanding. And on our way over, uh, we stopped at, uh, at a red light. Now, I don't know whether you know that or not, but that means that you should come to a complete halt in an automobile. Green means go. And uh, your red means... Just a moment, what, nice? And, uh... I think we'd better cut that. it off right now. No, this is what they want. We're they pay paying. for this. We're paying. No, they oh. pay good money for this kind of uh, Sir, we story. Don't, we don't pay money for any kind of story. Hello? Will you tell the nurse that uh, your time is up, please? My time is up, nurse. And uh, I hope you're feeling much better and that you're home very soon. Thank you. Goodbye, and keep the checks coming. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bob and Ray Research Division has done it again. They've come up with a startling new development. That's right, folks. Our scientists, in their unending search for better stuff for better living, have come up with a new product that's going to revolutionize the American landscape and make us rich. We now have available three warehouses full of our new product, ready to foist on the general public. Enough of all the palaver, Bob. Let's tell them what it is. Well, you probably guessed it by now. They're artificial trees that come in over 150 varieties. You heard right, folks. Artificial trees. Now you property owners who were victims of an overanxious bulldozer operator or a damaging forest fire or chestnut blight won't have to wait a lifetime for new trees to grow. Ray is right. If your property has been laid bare by locusts, termites, or just plain geography, you can turn it overnight into a veritable forest of realistic-looking trees. Now these trees come in many varieties, both evergreen and deciduous. I think we might explain to some of our listeners that a deciduous tree 
is one that blooms in the spring, bears fruit in the late summer, and loses its leaves in the fall. Now, should you buy one of the deciduous varieties, such as your maple, apple, peach, oak, chestnut, or dogwood, you get a set of four, one for each season, so that your neighbors need never know they're artificial. Now, these trees are made of sturdy cardboard, and some stand a full 50 feet tall when erected. Now, anyone who's handy with a pair of scissors and a pot of glue can assemble a forest in a matter of months. These majestic trees, which look like the real thing from a distance, have been proven by extensive wind tunnel tests to withstand gusts of up to five miles an hour without toppling. And they won't warp even in heavy drizzle. Now, how's that for real strength, folks? Now, just listen to this mail from customers who've had the privilege to test some of the first trees off the assembly line. Seaman First Class E.B. Lipsync with the Navy and McMurdo Sound Antarctica rights. The beautiful royal palm trees you sent us have made the Russian, British, and Japanese expeditions down here green with envy. Please, please send us your pussy willow trees. A.P. Runty of Death Valley, California writes, Nice going, Bob and Ray. I couldn't even grow cactus on my lizard ranch. But now, thanks to you guys, my place looks like the Garden of Eden. Well, we could go on like this for weeks reading mail, but right now I'd like to tell you how you can get these beautiful trees for your very own. You simply send for our free, colorfully illustrated catalog, which places you under obligation. And our courteous representative will call to help with your selections and work out the financing best suited to your income. Just drop a card to Phony Tree Offer, Bob and Ray, and say, My land is barren. We have with us today a Mr. Ken Slazinger. I hope I'm right. Slazinger. Oh, Slazinger. Mr. Slazinger is a representative of a new sponsor we've acquired, the Markwell Adult Game and Toy Company. Now, Mr. Slazinger not only Slazinger. Slazinger not only represents the company, but I understand he also invents many of their games. Would you move in here, Mr. Slazinger, and tell us a bit about Markwell Games and Toys? Well, it's a big operation. Our Woodstock plant alone covers 40 acres. I guess you need a factory that size to turn out adult games. Huh? Sure do. The thing about it, though, we use only a small portion of the space we have in the actual manufacturing of the game. Well, uh, what's the rest of the space used for? Well, the printing of instructions that go with the game. Sometimes I think I actually work for a publishing house. I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> some of the instructions for the games that are put out today are pretty elaborate. Well, there was one set of instructions ran 416 pages. No plot or anything like that, just instructions. I see. Uh, do you have a new game coming out on the market soon, Mr. Yes. Blazinger? Yes, I do. One of the games I invented myself, as a matter of fact. Oh. We at the Woodstock plant call it Game All. Game All, huh? The reason is it's so clever is because it has the elements of every game that's ever been devised. You can't name me a game that isn't included in this package in one form or another. Soccer? The cards are inflatable. can be kicked if the player so desires. Well, uh, how do you play the game? <laughs> well, it's been played with two people. Now, the game, the package, includes 83 decks of ordinary playing cards. You start by spreading all the cards on the floor in a pattern designated by the instructions. Well, uh, you need a lot of room for that. Now, yeah, it's best to play a game of this sort in a barn. Or a large open field. That's good, too. We found the wind flips over a good many of the playing cards, although we licked the problem. Oh, uh, how'd you do that? We drive stakes through the playing cards. Package comes with a stake for each playing card. Well, it doesn't sound like much of a game. Not to the layman, it doesn't. You see, the stakes are numbered. Yeah, but, uh... That just leaves us with a good many numbered stakes, doesn't it? Well, really? with your intelligence, you'd have no trouble at all learning to play this game. All right. Well, what happens next? Well, in the package, there's a sailor hat for each of the stakes. Hmm. The player takes the sailor hats and puts them on top of the stakes, taking great care to see he doesn't miss any. Well, uh, is that the end of the game? Yes. And if instructions have been followed, an aerial view of the whole layout would reveal the following message. USS Virginia and its crew greet you. Well, uh, I don't see anything so educational in that, really, well, sir. As far as I'm concerned, it teaches youngsters how to read. Well, if they happen to have an airplane. <laughs> That's right, yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Slazinger, and do come by again real soon and visit us again. Thank you. Welcome once again to the Geriatrics Corner, the show which attempts to create better understanding between employers and some of our senior citizens. 
Employers would do well to hire some of these people. Isn't that right, elderly Mr. Charles Belden? Well, that's right. It doesn't take a cold shower to get me started in the morning. And I ran on the job every morning at four. What sort of uh, work do you do, Mr. Belden? I work in a pig iron plant. My job is uh, to throw the ingots up on the truck. Well, that sounds like quite a job for a man who's 96. Well, sometimes it gets tough when I accidentally hit one of the truck drivers with an ingot and stretch him out. Last week, one of them chased me for three miles after he regained consciousness. Gee whiz. Mr. Belden, the purpose of this show, of course, is to create better understanding between senior citizens and employers. But you have a job. I know, but I'm not happy with it. I want the job I had during the Spanish-American War. I guess you were right up there fighting alongside the Rough Riders? No, I was in the Army Publicity Corps. We had to keep the boys happy with publicity. There was a lot of yellow fever going around at that time. Well, how did you help keep up the morale, Mr. Belden? Well, everybody was grousing about those mosquitoes, and it was my job as a member of the Army Publicity Corps to pep things up. Mm -hmm. I did that by writing all kinds of war sayings. Well, could you give us an example of a war saying, Mr. Belden? Sure. Sure. Like when... uh, there was going to be a battlefield charge the next day. I'd have to make up a thing like, don't mind the bayonet boys. Keep right on going. And you'd shout that just before the boys charged? Is that no, right? not me. I wrote it on a slip of paper and handed it to the lieutenant who was going to be at the head of the charge. He hollered it out. And did it pep the boys up? Not that bunch. They turned on the lieutenant. Did you ever uh, create any successful war things? Some we might remember. Well, let me think. Oh, yeah, the, here was a good one. Don't fire until you see his head. Then give him some lead. Oh, boy. That was a good battle for our side. There wasn't a shot fired. I got a medal for it. I don't wonder. That was an inspiring message. Did you ever get to see any action, Mr. Uh, Belton? Well, I never got out of my mosquito netting for the whole war. I pushed my messages through a small hole. I figured out it was chance enough a mosquito might have slipped through. That would have been ruinous. You bet. Well, Sonny... You heard some of my war sayings. Can you put in a good word for me at Army Publicity? Well, I don't think I'd want to, Mr. Bellman. Your sayings are just a little too crude. Well, then, here's one to remember from an old man. Ow. Jimmy McTavish, the famous actor, passed through uh, this past week, and uh, he was heading to Europe, and uh, before he left, he uh, answered a few questions on tape for us. Engineer, I wonder now if we'd be all set to go ahead with this interview. First of all, uh, Jimmy, it was great again to welcome you to our microphones, and what brings you to New York? Engineer, would you uh, turn the tape on to get the answers? Uh, Jimmy? Oh, yes, yes, that was... Mr. Brown goes to Washington. Very nice picture. Wait a minute. <laughs> will you uh, will you back that up? Uh, All right. What's the matter? Having trouble? Uh, I think it's Peter Grimm is oh, working on the. Let me go in the control. I'll see if I can straighten that out. All right. Well, thank you, thank you. Very nice to be here. Well, tell me, Jimmy. Uh, I understand that from here you're going to uh, Europe. That in your itinerary. Well, you do too, but of course the trumpet is rather a difficult instrument. Oh, I, 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 I got through it. All right. In one scene in your last movie, uh, you had to ride side saddle through a herd well, of. Well, uh, let's see. June Allison, uh, Betty Hutton. Uh, I can't remember any more, but they're all wonderful. Wonderful. Jimmy, uh, I know that. You love living in California and all, but what do you really think of... Hi, Bob and Ray. Uh, I think it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm forget it. certainly ready for you to fire the question. All right, forget it. It was nice talking with him, but it uh, just didn't work out very well. We'll try this again soon. <laughs> Maybe with a uh, little rehearsal, we would get this thing ironed out and on the air in proper form. Sorry I couldn't do anything with that, Ray. I, I had it all mixed up. In I know, I know. I heard it oh, on the air. Boy. Okay. Well, another thing backfired. Today we have uh, a gentleman right now with an unusual hobby, the uh, 
hobby is collecting souvenirs and autographs from famous people. His name is Millard T. Mismore, is that? Uh, That's and, right, uh, yes. Where are you from, sir? Uh, well, originally I was from Mount Vernon, New York, and I reside in Mount Vernon, Virginia. Well, what is uh, so unusual about your hobby? I know a lot of people collect uh, autographs and such. What? Well, there's nothing very unusual about the hobby itself. It's the way I go about it, uh, well, how, sir. How does that differ? Well, uh, every item in, in my collection was gathered while the famous person concerned was a complete unknown. You mean to sit there and tell me you can predict uh, the future, tell who's going to be famous before they are? Well, certainly not, Mr. Elliot. I'm not a mystic. I use various methods, such as playing hunches and uh, just plain guessing in many cases. I find that an autograph or a lock of hair is much easier to get when you're dealing with an unknown. Well, could you show me some of the items that you have? I know you brought some with you. Here, explain how you got them, will you? Well, now, uh, this is a shoelace here I got from Nelson Rockefeller when he just got out of college. Mm -hmm. I played a hunch there. This one uh, is a long shot. Gary Crosby's belt buckle. He was eight years old when I got that. And here's Keenan Wynn's toothbrush, which is some 30 years old. Well, now, so far, there's nothing ingenious about your guesses. They're all the offspring of famous people. Well, uh, here's one you'll like. It's an autograph that says, Best Wishes, Second Lieutenant Dwight D. Eisenhower. How'd you get that one? Well, I attended the West Point graduation that year, and I liked the cut of his jib, so I asked for a signature. That's that's amazing. That was a find. What, what are some of the others? Well, here's an old shaving brush from a barbershop Perry Como used to work in. Uh, I noticed him singing in there one day uh, while shaving someone. It was a long time ago, and I just took a wild shot. This this cufflink here looks familiar. Who does that belong to? I took that uh, cufflink from you around 1941 when you were an NBC guide. I was on one of your tours, and I liked the way you talked and handled yourself. So uh, when you lifted your arm to point out an old announcer named Frank Gallup, I grabbed it. Well, you know, I'm astonished, almost <clears throat> dumbfounded at that one. <laughs> I still have the other link at home. has a big E on it. I thought you'd stand aghast, but I hope you're not mad. Well, I was at the time, but I've cooled off since. What are these items here? Well, now, uh, this is a group of recent acquisitions that uh, have not yet become famous. Now, here's a lock of hair from Harvey Grosvenor, who I think will be the first man to set foot on the moon. Who is T.T. Uh, T. Barnsworthy, I see here? Well, I have a hunch he'll be Secretary of State in about 25 years. Here's a doll belonging to little Sadie Granby, who's going to discover a cure for flat feet. Well, time alone will tell on these, Mr. Mismore, and I want to thank you for coming up uh, with this very unique hobby of yours. Uh, this <laughs> zip gun here belongs to a kid named Shifty Schwab, who has a great future up there in prison. Uh, say, who's that gentleman over there reading? That's uh, my partner, Ray Goulding. You know, I like the way his eyes are set in his head. I think I'll try to snip his tie. Well, he's already famous. You can't... Uh... Oh, I never heard of him. Excuse me a minute. Ray, well, watch your tie. Father, oh, uh, Ray, will you hand me that phone? I see the light blinking. There must be a call coming in. Right over, Bob, boy. Hello. Father well, Ray here. Oh. Hello. Hello. This is Bob and Ray. Hey. Who is that? Hello. Hello, operator. Oh, I think Operator, it's Steve. I've been cut off. Is this Steve Bosco? Steve, how are you? No, no, this is Bob and Ray, oh, Steve. Bob and Ray, how are you? a bad is... connection there. We couldn't uh, make out your first words, but now I recognize Oh, uh, this is uh, Steve Bosco. How are you? Is this Ray? No, this is Bob. Oh, Bob, where are This right? is Bob. Uh, hey, Bobby. Did you get out of hey. that? Uh, yeah. How are you? Okay. Okay, fine. I'll give you a call. Well, last time Are you, you there? called. Yeah. Good. The last time we talked to you, you were in uh, pretty grave financial difficulties. Things haven't about... changed too much, Bob. Things haven't changed. If anything, they've changed for the worse. Where are you calling from this week? Well, I'm calling from uh, a little office that the DA has right next to his. Well, uh, are you still incarcerated? I'm locked up, fella. Well, I know, but I thought we uh, got... got Hello, oh, I've been cut week. off. No, you Hello. haven't. I can hear you fine. I need your help, really. Uh, they, they well, what me... did you do with the money we sent to you last week? Well, I had to put it to use. I had to pay back those fellas. Hello, Bob. Yeah, but you're still... Steve, how are you? Steve, look, I, I can I can hear you all right. Good. Don't, don't keep saying we've been cut off. The connection is perfectly good. What I want to know is, uh, why are they holding you? If we, we paid you the money to uh, get out of that trouble... And we sent it to you after the show last week, and uh, it was enough to cover all of your troubles. You should have gotten out of them 
Scott Freeze. Well, I've been signing a lot of checks. Waller O'Malley out here. Oh, boy. And I'm really, I'm in a fine kettle well, of fish. That's your old, old trouble, it's and it's your trouble, own... It's my trouble. It's my weakness. It's your own fault. Well, I need the money. And the DA is giving me till 7 o'clock tomorrow. Well, I don't know. I doubt it very much whether Please, we can see it your way. Please, just send it to the district attorney's office here in Los Angeles. No. Where? Los Angeles. All right. Okay, we'll see well, what we can do. Well, this is Steve Bosco, rounding third, being thrown out at home.